am Kathleen Stone, Director of Curriculum and Instructional Design at SUNY Empire State College, and I'm here today with Sumana Silverheels from Buffalo State College. Sumana, nice, nice to have you here. Can you introduce yourself a little? Sure. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I am Sumana Silverheels, and I work at the Disability Services Office at Buffalo State College as a Technology Accommodations Coordinator. Um, I, my background is mainly in assistive technology. I have extensive assistive technology implementation um, experience, and so I try to accommodate students to use technology to um, succeed, to be able to successfully access materials. Excellent. So I have, my first question for you is around the idea of proactive uh, design and being proactive with accessibility. Why do you think that's important? Um, I think in many times we have students that uh, do not disclose. So if you are in an online or blended or whatever classroom environment the student may be in, they are not obligated to actually disclose with to you that they have a disability. That's one point. Secondly, I think if you have your materials already accessible and you've already thought that design through, then you don't have to go ahead and make changes at the last minute, which kinds of hold things up for the students and the students may fall behind. So it's nice to have your, because it takes little effort to do things up front, then it takes a lot of effort to fix something that's already created. Mm -hmm. So making it accessible uh, right from the get-go is important. How, how would you advise faculty, though, to balance their, um, their academic freedom around their course design along with those specific needs of a student with disabilities? Um, faculty, I always say, they are the course, course content experts. So they know what they want to teach. They know their information really, really well. And we don't want them to change the way that they're giving that information to the student but they need to be able to create their curriculum in such a way that they're giving that same information but in formats that are easily um, available for the students to access no matter what their disability is. So you know if uh, they have low vision and blindness and they're magnifying something then it still needs to be you know retain some of the information in a way that it's easily accessible. Um, it you the things, the changes that they have to make, they're so minimum and so, like it becomes so routine mm -hmm. that they don't really have to think about whether their course content is changing. It's more the method of delivery or how to create than is changing. So really there is no, uh, they should not have that fear that they have to change their pedagogy, they have to change the way they're mm -hmm. teaching. The content has to stay the same, but just have multiple ways of delivery mm -hmm. and you know, understanding and kind of creating and getting that information from the student. Yeah, you know, yeah, so. I think that's really great advice. Yeah. Um, also, when we think about helping our students with disabilities and how we're designing courses, there's sometimes more than one person involved in that process. So you may have faculty members, instructional designers, educational technologists, all that have some kind of a role to play. What would you advise them about some of their responsibilities maybe with the regulations that are out there that we have to follow? Mm -hmm. So the regulations are there so uh, we are we are held responsible. We are you know held to some standards and those standards even though are, they are meant for students with disabilities they actually benefit a lot of different kinds of learners. So we all learn in different ways like you know I you and I ourselves we might have different learning styles mm -hmm. so it when when faculty is developing and these regulations are in place it's not something I always tell them don't don't think about the regulations as much think about why we are doing this we want to be compliant because yes we don't want to open ourselves you know be uh, vulnerable to lawsuits but at the same time as educators it is important for us to know that we are actually teaching our students. They are learning from the way they can learn. So to be able to get to them, to reach that population, no matter who is in your classroom. We never think about disability as being the focus of your changing the course. Think about how there are different kinds of learners mm -hmm. and the variety of that. You know, So everybody has a response. I know you asked me in the s instructional designers as opposed to mm -hmm. faculty as opposed to disability services. At the disability services office, we provide accommodations. So if your material is accessible, to have that work with the technology that we have is much easier. It's seamless. But if it's not accessible, then it we have to do 
three more steps at our end mm -hmm. to make it accessible and working with the technology that we have. So that is, you know, that's one of the reasons I think get go, doing it from the get go is a good thing. Right. What if, what if I'm at a faculty member or a staff member mm -hmm. at a campus that does not have a lot of support for accessibility, a lot of resources for me, what would you advise that I do? Um, I have to say that there is a lot out there. There is, there are, if you Google any, you go to any website for any college, there is some place where you will find information about how accessible materials are created. So there is no end to resources. Now how to assimilate that and take the relevant ones that apply, that is some out of the box thinking. So you kind of get this and say, okay, I have a Word document, but if I've created in a certain way, will this work? You can go out and find on the Ames website, you can go to the AHEAD website, you can go to individual college websites. You will find that they will give you step-by-step -step instructions. We always talk about not recreating the wheel, and there are so many wheels out there. Mm -hmm. They've been created so many times, and many of them give similar information. So when you start seeing a common theme, you know what steps you need to take. There is a lot of information in there. You don't have to be an expert in the field. You can search for anything you want and learn to do it. Yes, I think that that's a really great point that we, we can, there's a lot of resources out there that are at our disposal. Right. Um, even if we don't have a, a somebody on our campus who may know all the answers, there's a lot of places we can turn. And it's good to go, you know, just to follow up on that, it's good to go to like the, new, you know, we, our New York, New York State has the Disability Services Council. Um, so if you are in the state of New York, you have NYSDSC. If you're in the country of US, you have AHEAD. So you know, different, everybody has different ways to get to the information, and they're on the web. So it's not like you are, you know, geographically, you can be anywhere and access any information, uh, any resource that is available on the web. So yeah. it's easy. Could you talk a little bit about uh, universal design and what does that mean in the online environment or um, in a technology enhanced environment? Universal design um, helps create documents and learning and instruction to be able to reach a population, a wide variety of population. Universal design will then work with assistive technology. If you have something that is created uh, with the universal design concepts in mind, the technology aspect of it, the marriage of technology with the, with, with the information and the instruction is so much easier. You know, so if you have someone in your classroom or if a faculty has someone in their classroom that really learns more with doing rather than you know memorizing and taking quizzes, then they have a method of getting that information from that to uh, really understand if that student has understood what you've been trying to teach. So having different methods of uh, quizzing or getting that information, extracting that information to see if you have reached the population that you're trying to work with. Universal design, again, it doesn't have to be disability related. Mm -hmm. It has to be something more for everybody's use. So we work to that high standard of meeting our students with disabilities and we don't understand that how much we reach. We reach a wide variety of population because of it. Okay, that's great. Another aspect, and we talked about it just briefly, about this idea that there's some regulations and, and laws and so forth out there, but um, what are, what's the importance of, say, the Americans with Disability Act or the Section 508 standards that we sometimes have to follow or Section 504? All yeah. these things that people know are out there, but they may not understand <laughs> why or what, or, or what they mean. Yeah. Um, they, they basically are setting standards for us to uh, hold ourselves up to. So uh, to be able to create things that are uh, anybody can walk in and use. Mm -hmm. So you know, even just buying equipment or some things that are some purchasing, like states will have regulations that you have to buy some things that any everybody can use. Mm -hmm. So setting the standards high enough so that we are able to create that and meet those regulations so that if somebody does, and again, this also helps uh, students, if they are ha struggling, then they can fall back on it mm -hmm. and uh, say, you know, these standards were not met. So helping us also understand that there are some things that they can come back to us with. 
saying, you know, why are we not getting this information in the format we need, or why is it not addressed? So not that we are thinking of them as tools for, um, you know, it's it's more like talking to each other, getting to this place where we should be that we are all on the same page. You know, we can teach one other, but ultimately, I think that we as um, professionals and the educators, you know, as educators, we should be able to get to these students. Well, doesn't matter if there's a law out there or not, yeah. uh, right. helping us do it. Students. We have to serve the students, and s but the laws kind of help us enforce those um, sure. regulations. You okay. Know. So if, there, if you had any last minute or final comments that you would, um, advice that you would want to give to faculty or staff, what would that be? Um, I would say keep an open mind. You know, keep an open mind. Um, we have so many hidden talents, so many people with so much to offer that's within our students. Mm -hmm. And for us to be able to tap into that, to bring that out of them, that's part of why we are in this field of education. We want to bring out that genius yes. that's you know in our students that we may not recognize if we don't explore. So keeping an open mind, you know, thinking of creative ways of why we are doing certain tasks. What is the goal of a certain educational task or a quiz? What is the information you're trying to retrieve from these students? What are you trying to understand? Have them understand mm -hmm. that that conversation or that out-of-box thinking makes education so much more interesting, so much more fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like, okay, here's 100 questions and you need to get 80 right. You know, it's like, what did you achieve by getting those? I can do a multiple choice question and answer B, 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 two. I might get 50% of that <laughs> right. right. It does that mean that I have learned what I need to learn? So, you know, to be able to think out of the box, keep an open mind, don't think things are impossible to do or hard to do. We are all afraid of change. And sometimes a little tweaking helps, goes a long way. Yeah. Well, thank you. This was very enlightening. Um, I appreciate you, you taking the time to talk with us. Thank you very much. Yeah.